So, um, good morning. Um, so, you know what? What is slightly marginally better than a one trick pony? Like two trick pony? <laughs> so, I'm a two trick pony. Uh, um, so, on the one hand, um, I work on. Um, so, I really have a passion for flow and teaching flow through uh, business simulations. So that's one, one part of what I do. And on the other hand, uh, it's about upstream Kanban and discovery Kanban. Um, for the first part, I think if you're not interested in flow, then probably you're not attending the conference, right? Um, then the question is probably you're interested in upstream also. You, you understand what I mean with upstream? Eh? So it's the demand side, um, not the delivery side. Um, and so I assume that somehow you're interested in, in upstream. Just for my information, who's working on the demand side, on the upstream side? It's like in a function of product owner, product manager, uh, or coaching product owners or product managers. OK, quite a few people, OK? Um, then I assume that most of the other people are working on the downstream side. I hope to convince you that the upstream side is at least as important for you as, uh, as the downstream side. Um, so we've talked about some, uh, some successes already, in the, for example, in the keynote speech. So if I would uh, say to you that you've been working in, in this agile um, transition, or whatever you want to call it, um, and you've been working with an organization or a team, and this is the result that you get, right? You've been able to increase the throughput substantially, you've been able to reduce the lead time substantially, and all the while, your quality has, has improved as uh, the result of your agile uh, initiative. Would you consider that a success? Would that be considered a success? Yeah? Is that a success or no? The, console, the coaches will say it depends, right? The console, yeah? yeah? So would you consider that a, a, a success of your Agile initiative? You feel that it's a trick question? Yeah? Okay, it's, and it is a, a trick question, right? So, um, so from one perspective, it is a success. And for many organizations, it would be, would be considered a success, right? Okay? But on the other hand, we need to recognize that it is a local optimization, right? It's a, an optimization of only one part of the organization, which is the delivery part, okay? So you've been able to improve your capability uh, to better meet the demand, okay? So to say it a little bit um, disrespectful, you've been able to improve your capability to take orders, right? Okay. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that you're taking the right orders, yeah, that you're creating optimal value. Okay? So it's only a local optimization. Okay? What I want to do today is, with this presentation, is look at the whole. Okay? Not just uh, the little part is, that is the, the delivery part. Oh, wrong way. Wrong direction. So in terms of um, looking at the whole, yeah, so we shouldn't only be looking at improving the capability to better meet the demand. We should also be looking at better understanding the demand, better shaping the demand, creating the demand. And not only that, eh, we need to be able to look at the end-to-end -end flow, okay? which is the alignment between the delivery side and the demand side. Okay? And that's, that alignment uh, uh, is, uh, is crucial in this. So if we're talking about end-to-end -end flow, uh, we need to look at uh, we need to look at uh, the whole. So, in terms of creating value, uh, um, it's not only about improving our capability to better meet the demand, uh, not only improving our capability to uh, to take orders. Okay, it's also about uh, shaping the demand to better make use of our capability. Okay, now. That sounds trivial, right? It sounds almost uh, trivial to say, but apparently in practice it's, um, it's uh, a little bit more difficult. Right? 
Um, obviously, if our um, delivery capability is higher than our demand, then we need to create demand, right? Uh, and then the other way around, if our capability to deliver is lower than the demand, yeah, then we need to do something about the demand. We need to shape the demand, okay, to better utilize our capability. Okay. Now, obviously, in an organization where the demand is higher than, um, than uh, our capability to deliver, what is the first thing that we do? Yeah, we try to improve the capability to deliver. Okay? And apparently, being able to shape the demand yeah, is something we think only of in the second half. Okay? Now, obviously, yeah, when we're shaping the demand, we need to take into account the constraints of delivery. Right? We need to take into account what are our del delivery capabilities when we take demand. Okay? Now, in many cases, we don't even have the people that are taking the demand don't really have a very good sight on, on the constraints and the, and the capabilities of delivery. Yeah? So it, it seems to be that it's easy to observe that there's two parts to the equation, yeah? but putting it into practice is, um, is, uh, is different, is a little bit harder. Um, so the traditional approach to shaping demand is portfolio management, right? Okay, so we put all our, uh, our requests, our initiatives next to each other. We determine some criteria. Then we're going to score uh, those requests against those criteria. Okay, and then we try to come up with, uh, with an optimal choice. Okay, an optimal choice in terms of creating uh, the highest possible value that we can, uh, we can create. Um, the, the mindset behind that is uh, rational decision making, right? It's uh, quantification, okay? And probably quantification in terms of, yeah, dollars. Um, so we try to, uh, to do a quantitative assessment of all our initiatives, all our requests. We try to make an optimal decision based on that, uh, on that assessment. And then we execute, right? And clearly, that puts the team that needs to execute into an order-taking role, right? We make a big decision uh, up front, eh? so we, uh, we separate the decision-making from the decision execution, okay? So that all works uh, very well in theory. In practice, there's a couple of uh, obstacles. Eh? There's a couple of obstacles. One ob obstacle is um, incommensurability. I had to practice a couple of times on that word. Yeah. Incommensurability means that uh, not everything is uh, as easily uh, comparable to each other, right? We might have many uh, initiatives that ha are more like run the business type of initiatives, right? So it's recurring business, right? Uh, so these are the types of initi initiatives where uh, the organization knows what to expect. Uh, value might not be uh, uh, very high, but it's very predictable, right? So it's low risk. Uh, in terms of decision making, there's not a lot of stakeholders involved. Um, there's not a lot of uh, discussion. Yeah? Um, I'll call them low friction items later. Yeah? Okay. Now, obviously, these items are, because they're more predictable, you can compare them better. Um, but on the other hand, you also have items that are more like uh, out of the routine, change the business type of uh, uh, requests or uh, initiatives. Um, value might be higher, but it's also much more uncertain. More people are involved. Uh, there's more decision making to, to be done. Okay? And comparing those tools is, uh, is much, uh, much uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh? Uh, if we want to stack rank, uh, rank, stack rank, stack rank them, yeah, uh, it's quite hard. Yeah? So that's incommensurability. So that's that's a known problem, okay. And uh, obviously, um, portfolio theory has uh, has tried to solve that problem with all kinds of complex uh, uh, quantitative assessment me methods uh, um, to uh, to be able to stack rank them. But still, it's a it's a problem. 
Uh, on the other hand, in terms of flow, um, I think um, at least an, an, uh, an equally important problem is that demand doesn't present itself so regularly, right? It's not very structured, yeah? Um, Arlette and myself are running a, a small company. Our customers don't come when uh, it's optimal for us when they come. Yeah? And they don't come on a regular basis, yeah? Um, so there's times where you have uh, fewer customers coming in, smaller customers. There's times where suddenly two, three, five, four, five strategic customers come in at the same time, right? So the mod doesn't present itself um, at the timing that, that you want it uh, to, uh, to present itself, okay? So we might have more um, items that are uh, faster and more frequent, which are typically um, the more routine type of, uh, of requests or uh, alternatives, okay? And we might have items or requests or alternatives that only come in in a very infrequent way uh, and very haphazardly, right? Okay? So it doesn't represent itself um, um, uh, on a regular, uh, in a very regular uh, way, okay? Now, what does the traditional portfolio management do about this? How do we cope, the traditional portfolio management, how do they cope with this? Huh? Wait, yeah, batching, right? Annual budgeting, yeah? So that's our way of coping with this. Yeah? We batch our decisions. Yeah? We, uh, we keep our decisions all together, yeah? And we do an annual budgeting cycle, okay? Not very flow-like, right? So, um, in theory, uh, this idea of portfolio management is a, uh, is a, sounds like good. Uh, uh, in practice, uh, there's a couple of problems. Now, the more we batch our decisions, obviously, the more we have um, a mismatch, uh, or the more chance that we have in terms of having a mismatch between the demand side uh, and the, the, the delivery side. Uh, if the cadence of decision making on the demand side is not the same as the cadence of the delivery uh, of the delivery side. Uh, we can expect uh, a mismatch between those two. Okay. Now that mismatch, what does that mean? Well, uh, we have our team ready. Decisions have not been made. Okay, so we've contracted uh, a supplier, yeah, but the initiatives are not ready to be executed. Okay, uh, you can see the waste, right? On the other hand, uh, our yearly budgeting cycle, uh, we have many projects coming at the same time, yeah? so we're overloading uh, the teams that need to, uh, need to execute them. Uh. So this is what we call the impotence mismatch between uh, upstream and, and downstream. So this kind of like um, goes to the core of what I think is the, the upstream problem or the upstream challenge. Yeah. It's like this irregular incoming demand yeah, that comes at a very irregular pace, uh, where things are um, incommensurable, right? Um, on the one hand, that's on the incoming side, and on the output side, we need to create a steady flow of demand for, uh, for the team that it's need, needs to deliver it. Yeah. Because we know that uh, the teams, teams that need to deliver it, work best in a very on a on a on a steady pace. Eh? That um, that work is best organized organized around a very steady flow of uh, of work. Eh? And the the purpose of the upstream is to cover that gap. Is to cover that gap, eh? knowing that on the demand side, eh, the incoming is very irregular, is incommensurable, and on the output side, eh, things need to be very even, very regular our flow, and we need to be able to um, have items that are all uh, very predictable and, and uh, uh, to create a steady flow, okay? So that's, to me, is, uh, is the challenge uh, uh, for, uh, for upstream. So let's look at, um, at a case um, to, uh, to, to illustrate this. So this is an, um, the case of an an IT maintenance team. So on the demand side, 
uh, we have the different uh, business domains, HR, logistics, um, manufacturing. Okay. So all the different business domains on the demand side. On the delivery side, we have an, uh, an IT maintenance team that does um, um, ERP, some ERP stuff, uh, some uh, Java development, uh, application development, some EDI, some, uh, some uh, uh, BI. So the team is uh, uh, distributed over these different, uh, different competencies. With the team, we started to, um, to set up an end-to-end Kanban -end system. Uh, the delivery side, obviously, being focused on delivering uh, all those requests. Okay? On the demand side, uh, in terms of understanding, uh, understanding what those requests uh, uh, mean. Okay? All those requests coming from the different business uh, units. So, um, system Kanban success. Right, um, so we started uh, implementing, focusing as always, as can be expected. We started focusing on the downstream side, right, um, and especially the side, the, the part of the downstream that was under control uh, of the team, which is what I call the system cam man, right, which is the part from where the team commits the work to where it's ready for user acceptance testing. Right? Because that's the part that the team has control over. Quite a success in terms of the team started uh, at uh, a whip of, if you look at the, the cumulative flow diagram, the team started at a, a work in progress of approximately uh, 45 items, which was like three items per person. Um, and the reasons that for that was like, yeah, we have all these different competencies, so we can't take over each other's work. Uh, we have uh, work being is stuck because the users are not available uh, for um, uh, for helping us out, for accepting what we what we've been delivering. Uh, so many different reasons why they had uh, this uh, this high whip. Uh, so we were able to, with some minimal interventions, we were able to um, to reduce the whip. Uh, to 35, which is not spectacular, but enough, uh, in terms of reducing our lead time from approximately 12 weeks to a lead time of, um, of six weeks. And if you look at the cumulative flow diagram, you see that our curve, the bottom curve here, uh, where do I, so the, the burn, yeah, the delivery curve eh, um, slightly curls up. Uh, meaning that our uh, delivery rate was uh, increasing slightly. Okay, now for a team that has that was in the past having a backlog that was slightly growing, uh, this type of improvement meant that we could keep the backlog st starting to come stable, not growing anymore, and even diminishing a little bit. Okay, so while this is not spectacular for the team and for their business partners, it was really uh, a, a success. Okay. So we can declare success and go home, right? Uh, in the end, we didn't, right? Um, so I remember um, going back to uh, and the CEO taking me aside and said, like, yes, Patrick, this is good, okay? Um, but now uh, we need to work, work, work more with our business partners. We need to make sure that we're delivering the right stuff. Okay. Now, although the business did um, did recognize this as, uh, as a success, as, a, as a, a, a big step forward. In the end, many of the partners in the business will, were still complaining because for them, for the team, it's the, the, lead, the system lead time, uh, the lead time from committing the work to ready for UAT was really important and reducing that lead time was really important. For the customer, the clock starts ticking not when the IT team is ready to start the request. Eh? The clock starts ticking when they make the request. Okay? So for the customer, the customer lead time was much more important than the system lead time. Okay? Now, if you look at uh, the customer uh, lead time, which is uh, graphed here, customer lead time was still pretty long and pretty variable. Okay? So uh, customer lead time, this is expressed in weeks. Eh? 
So a customer lead time varying between uh, less than one week and uh, more than uh, more than 30 weeks. Now, uh, which is quite a, um, a variable in long customer lead time. Knowing that um, this is actually uh, um, a, a very rosy picture of the customer lead times because um, these are only the work items that have been delivered, right? Okay, yeah. So the work items that haven't been delivered, yeah, you can imagine their lead time. Um, so enough to um, uh, as an incentive to uh, to have a look at the at the upstream. Um, now this is a little bit of an, uh, a simplification of the the upstream board. So we started already from the beginning with a visualization of the upstream process, which essentially uh, the upstream process was a process of uh, when the customer make, makes a request, you clarify that request, you, um, you get, get an understanding uh, with the customer what the request is about. There's some kind of scorecarding uh, around it to, uh, um, to rank the request, right? Uh, there's an, uh, an analysis, um, and then there's an evaluation based on that analysis uh, with, uh, with an approval in terms of, yes, uh, we're going to go for it, okay? Uh, knowing that sometimes this is not a, a one-step process, but sometimes uh, things iterate uh, in there. Okay. Um, further, what you see um, here is also we had like some more kind of low-value, low-risk uh, requests, and then higher-value, uh, higher-risk uh, requests, uh, bigger items in the in the request. Um, so what do we observe? So we started with a visualization, just a visual board. It's not a, an upstream Kanban in the sense that it contains uh, limits or constraints. It's really just a visualization. And what we observe in this visualization is uh, what I call a barbell flow. Yeah? Uh, a barbell like for weightlifting. Yeah? And all the weight is uh, either on this side of the board or on this side of the board. Okay. So it's a very uneven flow. Eh? It's a pipeline. If this would be a sales pipeline, it would be a sales pipeline with bubbles in it, okay? with gaps in it. Okay? Now, obviously, what does that mean? Eh? That means that later on, when that work moves to the downstream, yeah, that for the downstream, we will also have unevenness in the demand for the downstream. Okay? Um, so what we observed is that low value items tended to flow uh, very quickly into the ready to commit column because they have low friction in the upstream, okay? And then high value item, items tended to get stuck on the left hand uh, side of the, of the upstream board, okay? And that created that barbell flow, that created that barbell flow, okay? So, uh, here on the on the picture of the board, you actually see it very uh, very clearly. Yeah? You see it very clearly. Okay, so um, obviously, high value items that got stuck on the left hand side of the board. Lots of discussions, stakeholders uh, disagreeing. Yeah? High friction, right? Uh, that high friction remained up until the point where yeah, uh, executive management called and said like. Time's up, okay? And that's the time when um, these, uh, these items got expedited to the downstream, okay? Because typically these are items that have some kind of a due date, at least in the mind of, uh, of the business, of the customers. Um, and so when that due date is approaching, yeah, uh, all the uh, discussion was stopped and it got ex they got expedited uh, to the downstream. Obviously, with the effect that these are, this is work that has not well, been well prepared for the downstream, so we need to start on things that are not clear, leading to quality problems downstream, yeah? but other, also they lead to overcommitment downstream, right? Because time's up, whatever you're doing, yeah, we need to do it. And typically, they were doing lower value work, yeah? and they needed to interrupt that lower value work for uh, uh, for those expedited uh, requests. Okay, so it leads to overcommitment uh, downstream also. 
Um, also, um, the right-hand uh, side of the upstream board with the many low-value items, yeah, the, the result of this was exactly this phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the team spent, uh, the upstream team spent a lot of time in scorecarding, analyzing these uh, uh, low-value, low-risk items. But then, in the end, these low-value, low-risk items got stuck in the ready-to-commit column. Yeah. They got stuck there because they got bypassed, right? They got bypassed by those uh, expedited, uh, uh, or even if they're not expedited, by higher value, higher, uh, uh, higher risk items. Okay, so that created this uh, huge backlog of items in the inventory of items in the ready to commit uh, column, leading to a lot of frustration, of course. Uh, okay, from a business, uh, the business owner of that item, yeah, it's like. Yeah, you were ready, and now the item is there in the in the ready to commit, and many of these items really die there. Eh? Okay, and obviously then we start discussing policies in terms of um, after how many months are we going to clean up our uh, ready to uh, commit inventory? Right? Okay, so we got, we're starting to have some discussions on uh, uh, on uh, um, yeah. Um, decommissioning items from the ready to commit uh, column uh, and the policies around that yeah which is not a very uh, value adding activity yeah. it's a wasteful activity um, so not a lot of flow in the uh, in the upstream um, and in itself that's not a, a terrible thing but uh, if there's not a lot of flow in the upstream obviously uh, you're not creating a lot of flow uh, in the downstream. So more friction than flow in terms of over-processing, uh, doing analysis work, um, uh, too much analysis work, analysis paralysis, uh, keeping on discussions about items, um, a large inventory of, uh, of items that are aging, that are dying in front of uh, the commitment point, um, expediting, yeah, and then um, having, um, rather than have selecting items early on in the upstream, which from a value perspective makes, makes more sense, items get selected actually very late in the upstream. And on what basis do they get selected? Yeah, they get selected on the basis, do we have time, yes or no? Yeah? Not on the basis, do, do they add value? Okay. Um, so, in terms of value creation, for the downstream team, it turns out, well, we've done our best. We've improved our capability to uh, um, uh, meet, better meet the demand, right? And we can prove it, okay? But for the, uh, from the value side, from the demand side, what they're seeing is an oversupply of low value items, yeah? And an undersupply of uh, high value items. The only way that we get high value items in is expedited. Okay, so from a value creation perspective, maybe not optimal. Um, so looking at why this is so, eh, we can, come only, can only come back to the mindset. Eh? The mindset of trying to quali quantitatively uh, assess everything. Eh? In this case, quantity of assess everything to uh, a sort scorecard. Eh? Trying to make an optimal decision, yeah? analyzing everything to, uh, to make sure that we're making the right decision, okay? and then uh, splitting the decision making from the decision execution seem to be uh, the root cause of, uh, uh, of what we're seeing. Um, so in terms of all the effort, the upstream effort, the effort that was made uh, was put into the decision making, it seemed that that effort didn't, uh, uh, was not, uh, not the optimal effort. Okay? On the one hand, the items in which we put the most effort are also the items that uh, are at the highest risk of being delayed or modified or even cancelled, yeah? okay? creating waste, yeah? creating effort that is just wasted. Okay? And on the other hand, we have all those lower value, low risk items, where also we put a lot of effort in 
Yeah? Maybe not on the individual items, but on the group of items. Yeah? We put a lot of effort in them, and those get stuck into, uh, into the ready to commit uh, just before the commitment point, and they die there. Uh, so it appears that our decision-making effort uh, is not, uh, is not uh, paying off. Um, now, the, the thinking behind it is we need to put a lot of effort in making decisions, right? Okay. Now, obviously, uh, if you look at it from just from a systems dynamics perspective, uh, the more effort that you put into making the decision, yeah, the less alternatives that you can evaluate. Okay? Now, if you can only evaluate less alternatives, you need to make sure that you pick the right alternatives to evaluate, yeah? which kind of contradicts the purpose. right? Because that means that at the start, you already need to pick the right alternatives. Okay? So apparently, the decision-making effort just um, uh, deceits or uh, conflicts with the purpose of the actual decision-making itself. Okay. Um, so looking back, the conclusion is it's clear that not all the different alternatives. Eh, we're coming back to this incommensurability uh, uh, thing. Yeah. Not all the alternatives need to go through the same decision-making process. So uh, that's one conclusion. Eh? They, all, they don't need all, all to go back to the same decision-making process. Eh? Uh, if um, we're talking about alternatives where value might be low, but quite certain, yeah, once we decide to evaluate that alternative, yeah, we can just do the evaluation in one go. Yeah? We can commit to do uh, the uh, analysis and evaluation effort in one go. Yeah. Okay. Um, but for uncertain items, it might be better to, if we say we're going to evaluate, yeah, to do a very uh, low cost evaluation. Yeah. First, an initial evaluation. We evaluate based on that, and then do a more uh, elaborate evaluation uh, second. Now, if you're familiar with options thinking, this is options thinking, right? For low, uh, low high uncertainty, high certainty, low uncertainty, yeah, you commit. Yeah? For high uncertainty, you create an option first. Okay. Now, how does that work in practice? Yeah? How does that work in practice? In practice, it means that you need to redesign your upstream process. Okay. So, in the case we redesigned the upstream process for um, for the high risk, high value, high risk items. We need re redesigned our upstream process um, to not go from um, zero to one in one step. Zero being the capturing of all the different opinions, right? Of all the different one-liners capturing the, the requests and then analyzing them, right? Which is uh, the process that I see most often in most organizations. Yeah. But to first do a, what, what we call a synthesis step. Yeah. So not looking at the parts, but look at the whole. Okay. So we built in uh, a synthesis step before uh, going into analysis. Yeah. So we're going from opportunity to option to commitment. Okay. Now, in practice, this synthesis step is like making sure with all the business stakeholders, eh, are we talking about the same thing? Okay, do we have the shared common vision about what, uh, uh, what the solution will look like? Okay. Uh, in practice, uh, we use, if you're familiar with it, we use uh, story mapping uh, as a technique. Eh? So we're going from uh, capturing stories to story mapping to actually go elaborating on the stories, uh, splitting them, uh, acceptance criteria, and so on. Okay. So we have a, a two-step process. So that's one uh, countermeasure that we took, redesigning uh, the upstream process. Let me go back, sorry. Uh, so for high-risk items, they go through this, oh, God, sorry. <laughs> um, so they go through this two-step process, and then obviously low-risk items go middle, skip the synthesis step, right? Okay. Um, 
So that was one thing. The other thing is triage. Okay. So because now we're making a distinction between items that need to go through an elaborate uh, upstream process and items that need to go through a less elaborate uh, upstream process, we can start making a triage. Okay. So we can uh, triage those items that we say they're not going to uh, survive, the black items, they're not going to survive uh, the upstream process anyhow, so uh, we'll reject them from the start. Red items being items that we need to expedite. The house is burning, uh, the house is on, on fire, so we need to expedite them um, to, the, to the downstream immediately and, and uh, 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 start working on them uh, immediately. And then the, the important distinction between the yellow and the green items. Uh, yellow items meaning items that we expect to have high friction in the upstream. Uh, so we expect that they require quite some lead time. So we need to be preemptive there. Remember, those are the items that got stuck in the upstream. Uh, so we need to be very preemptive. We need to be proactive in terms of working with our business stakeholders. And they need to go through this uh, multi-step uh, uh, decision-making process. Uh, we need to go quickly go through a synthesis uh, and then uh, go into analysis. Uh, okay? So those are the items that we try to schedule early and commit late. Okay? And then the green items, which are the items um, in, the, in a field hospital, uh, because this, where, this is where triage comes from. In the field hospital, they call them the ambulant patients. Okay? So that's a nice term for the patients that they come in and we just leave them in the corridor, right? Okay, now in this case, literally, eh, the, the green items are the items that uh, business users can make a request, yeah? uh, but unless we're in need of more green items uh, downstream, yeah, we're not even going to look at the request, okay? So we pull them in only on, uh, on demand, okay? So these are the items that we uh, consider as items that have low friction in the upstream. Okay, so redesigning the upstream Kanban. Uh, you see the uh, updated uh, uh, um, upstream process. Um, you see uh, triage uh, in terms of uh, yellow items, green items, uh, abandoned items which are outside of the board and then red items which are, which are expedited immediately to, uh, to the downstream. Um, the yellow items going through an elaborate uh, upstream process, green items going through um, an, um, a less elaborate uh, upstream process. And then you'll also see minimum options, sorry, minimum options in terms of making sure that at all times we can, uh, we can provide the right uh, mix of options to our, uh, to our downstream team. At all times, we have um, more higher value, higher risk items available for the downstream team uh, to work on. So again, are we there yet? Yeah, so we've gone through system Kanban, we've gone through upstream Kanban, okay? Um, well, not entirely yet. Eh? Uh, what we observed is that, well, the business users, that are, avail uh, are needed in the upstream part uh, to clarify and to help in the synthesis and analysis uh, are also needed in the downstream part. Now, often they are not available, okay? So that means that the business users are pushing work into the downstream and not available for pulling work out uh, at the end from the, uh, from the upstream, okay? So we needed to find a way to, uh, uh, to deal with that. Um, one solution is uh, customer Kanban, okay? So literally business users are handed out Kanban tokens, okay? Now every business user can make a request, yeah? But they can only initiate the upstream process for a request if they have a customer Kanban token for it, okay? When do they get the customer Kanban token back? Okay, at the end, okay? So this incentivizes the business users to collaborate with the downstream team uh, to, uh, uh, deliver uh, as quickly as possible. Again, are we there yet? Okay, so we talked about system Kanban, upstream Kanban, customer Kanban. Well, probably some of you will be saying, yeah, well, Patrick, um, you're still in, uh, in the mode of delivering outputs, right? You're talking about 
having a shared common vision about the solution that we're going to provide. Yeah. Now, obviously, are we, the question is, are we uh, solving the right problem, right? And so this is still a question. It's a little bit outside of the, the scope of the presentation. This is still a question that needs to be uh, uh, addressed, right? So we need to talk with our, uh, work with our business users, not just in terms of, ach, I'm using the, the wrong button, not use, only use in terms of solution design, but also in terms of discovering what problem are we, uh, do we need to solve. Yeah? And not only that, uh, we know that there will be feedback loops in terms of uh, are we solving a worthwhile problem to solve? Uh, is, it, uh, is it desirable for the users? Can the users do their job with the solution that we're providing? Can we build a solution? We know that there's feedback loops. How can we shorten those feedback loops? Eh? How can we anticipate those feedback loops? Okay? And um, build that in into our Kanban system. Eh? So this is the area of um, uh, real discovery Kanban. Eh? Running experiments eh? and managing those experiments and weaving that into the upstream downstream process. Okay? So, in terms of coming back to of the beginning of our uh, uh, presentation, eh? so it's not just about delivery, eh? it's also about demand. Okay? So in terms of uh, not just looking at the parts, we need to look at the whole. Eh? So we need to move beyond the agile development part eh? into the agile business part. Eh? So not just worker pool, not just flow from commit to ready for UAT, but end-to-end -end flow, customer pool. Right? Not just collaboration in the team, but collaboration with our customers. Okay? Not just responding to change, order taking, yeah? but actually anticipating, creating change. Okay? So in terms of flow, we not only need to look at uh, the downstream flow, right? and although if we're talking about scaling, it's not just about scaling the downstream in terms of flow in teams, flow across teams, but for me, most, more importantly, scaling sideways, right? Scaling towards the demand side, okay? Recognizing that the problems that we're solving on the delivery side, which is all about variation, bottlenecks, uh, constraints, yeah? And the, the problems that we need to solve on the upstream side are quite different problems, yeah? and our thinking should be quite different. Okay. On the upstream side, it's all about ambiguity, irregular demand, uh, uncertainty. Okay. So that kind of sums it up. Yeah. So don't be a one-trick pony, be a two-trick pony. <laughs>